For DrydenWire.com, I'm Ben Dryden, and welcome to episode 12 of the Brian Cole Story. Brian, welcome back. Good morning. It is a good morning. It is. It is a great morning on a lot of levels. Um, I had a conversation with you after last week's show, going through some things, and I'm even getting emotional just thinking about it, um, and you prayed with me. Thank you. That really helped. And life's getting better, man. You know, little things, but a lot of the yeah. things that you're talking about <laughs> have been impacting me a lot. Because um, I have my addictions, I have my struggles. You know, I'm a man of faith and I'm a Christian, but I think sometimes Christians, we look at them, or society looks at Christians as you're supposed to be perfect. Yeah. No, that's yeah. not how it works, man. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's a word that you brought up, and I don't know why all of a sudden I'm going off on this. <laughs> I, had no, I did not think I was going to. Um, but you had this word last week and it was contrition yeah. and i've been i think that's where a lot of christians are lacking right now there's just no sense of contrition there's no contr- yeah. at all it's ah, yeah. eh, whatever you know that's okay god will forgive me but right. you should have contrition yeah so i just want to say thank you for that brother you're welcome man we all need that <laughs> yeah no kidding so these have been really impacting me a lot and hopefully other people uh, they're learning or they're they're seeing other parts of christianity and faith and things that you have gone through. So at the very, very least, I know one person has been positively affected by these shows, and that's me. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, so we we left off last week. And by the way, if anyone has not watched the previous 11 shows, or if you want to watch those, they're on our YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com slash Dreidenwire. We left off last week. You were in prison still. I think you had like a 17-month sentence. Was that right? Yep. And you are still in prison, so let's pick up right there. All right. Yeah. So I was in the Stanley prison. We kind of went through that stuff. I got transferred through the ERP or earned release program at the Chippewa prison, uh, minimum camp. So got shipped over there. I was uh, supposed to go into the six month program. And uh, so well, wait, hold different... on. What was that? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's just awesome. I didn't, I didn't have my sound off. Oh, Wow, it's like Star Trek show or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got a text. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Go ahead. All right. So, yeah, I was uh, brought into the ERP program, ERP room release program. There's like a three-month one, a six-month one. Um, I was uh, going to be going through the six-month one. Uh, basically, it's just a six-month long addictions, I guess, type of program that you go in through uh, with a group of other individuals and you have a counselor and there's various programs going on here. It's all very dramatic. (laughs) There's a lot of drama. Um, but anyway, uh, it was a couple months or whatever I had to sit there before the program started. So, um, immediately when I went to the Chippewa prison, uh, it was flashback time because here I am walking out in the yard and right across the street from the yard is all these storage units. And that was the storage unit where I used to keep all my drugs and, uh, get, get high in there a lot. But, um, yeah, so there was a lot of, a lot of flashbacks going on, a lot of, uh, you know, just these visions from my past, yeah. uh, walloping me. It wasn't, it was a, a tactic of the enemy. And, and I really, uh, there was a lot of spiritual warfare going on during that time. Plus I'm in my own hometown now. And, you know, just my mind is going back to all these things that I was doing and even things like, and, and this is what the addiction does to you. Even the sun rises, uh, when I'd go out and the sun was coming up, uh, that brought flashbacks because usually, you know, when I'm out on my, however long I'm staying awake on the meth and, uh, usually when it, the, the sun's coming up, I'm leaving someone's house and going back home or, oh. or something, you know, is that daytime you're in the darkness daytime. That's the time to hide out somewhere, you know? So, uh, that brought flashbacks and there were just a lot of, a lot of struggles, spiritual struggles during that time where the enemy wanted me to take my mind back to the old, the way of, you know, of my old life. And, um, so yeah, yeah the, the Lord all, always won out on all those, but I still went through a lot of that during that period there in Chippewa. Mm-hmm. Um, while I was there, uh, hanging out, I, I met a couple guys that I had discipled into the occult. Um, they were really freaking out on me and where I was at in my faith walk and, and, uh, gave me another, yet another opportunity to talk to some guys that I had negatively impacted in my life. So that was pretty cool. And then, uh, one of the other guys I met was Mike Potts and, uh, Mike Potts, Potts, he's a lifer. Um, his family and our family, my dad and his dad were like best friends. Um, 
he did a he, he killed a man back in the 80s in uh, Chippewa Falls. Uh, never really knew the guy that well. Never hung out with him. We had two different lifestyles. Um, and while he was he got saved shortly after he was arrested uh, during that. So he's been saved that whole time. And and I knew that we were in Green Bay together back in the early 80s. And I never kicked it with him because he was a, one of those Bible thumpers. Yeah, yeah, Jesus freak. But yeah, but I met him there, and and we used to sit and talk, and you know, talk about our family and Jesus and what happened to us both and all that. So that was kind of cool. Um, during this time. Uh, like I said, when I had wrote all those letters to the uh, the different churches while I was in jail, only got that one reply, and that was from Stu. He came. Now he was coming more often because he lived in Chippewa. Um, I'm from Chippewa, so uh, my mom started coming and visit me a little bit more, and uh, some of the volunteers from the Chippewa County Jail that ran some of these programs were coming to visit me, including Mike Potts' dad, Dale Potts. He was one of the volunteers at the uh, jail in Chippewa, so he was coming to visit me too, and um, in the meantime, Stu, uh, he come up and visit me. He was con constantly discipling me, and the, I was just so awed by that guy and the wisdom he had of the Bible. And you know, I was getting I was getting it intellectually, but he was putting it into practical words and, and living it out. And um, so he was one of my uh, teachers as far as application, <laughs> real life application stuff. Yeah, man, that's legit. So one of the other things that were going on in there, uh, you know, so. Sh after you you completed the program, if you completed the program, you were you were going to be released. Um, so there was part of that program was trying to get yourself set as far as what's going to happen when you get out. You got to have a pro plan, and I didn't have nowhere to go. I had no idea what was going on with my wife because there was that no contact. Um, I I pretty much had lost everything. Uh, I nowhere to go. Uh, so there was that deal going on. A lot was on my mind during this because now I know I'm you know within a year of getting out and. So anyway, I remember one of the times, because we're going to focus most of this on this letter from my mom, but um, while my mom, uh, I, was, I was visiting Dale Potts, the volunteer from the jail one day, and the guard came and said, hey, your mom's here. Do you want to cut this visit short and visit with her? And I'm like, by all means. And my mom came in and visited. Uh, shortly after this, I don't know, a month or two, when Dale, Dale Potts came back up to visit me again, he told me, he says, you know, that day your mom came in when I was visiting, we passed each other in the hallway and your mom had stopped me and asked me, Dale, do you think that he's being real or is this another one of his tactics? And, uh, that, that, that was pretty powerful to me because I, I knew I was authentic, but yeah, I, my, I lived my, I lied to my mom so much that she was just, she didn't really want to believe it. Um, she wanted, she didn't want to get hurt or broken again. And uh, so th that was a pretty impacting moment. Um, so anyway, uh, I finally get involved with this program. I think there's like 12, 13 guys in the in the group. And it's just all, like I said, it's a bunch of drama. It's a bunch of worldly stuff. And just they're, they get paid to do these programs. And there was a couple things I got out of the whole deal, but not a whole lot. But I, I was, every time that we had a a program or something that we had to do like one one session we were working on anger so uh, we each had to write papers on certain aspects of anger so my my thing was i was supposed to write a pa paper about what causes anger well you know i'm in the lord now and, and all my authority all my knowledge is coming from the bible so i biblically i studied and looked everything up and i did my thing about what god says about how or why we become angry and really the conclusion is uh, anger is selfishness you know, if you look at 99 percent of the time the things you're angry about is because you ain't getting your way or things ain't working out the way you want it's all because of selfishness so i wrote my paper on this and it, i don't know it wasn't too long maybe two months into the program and my my counselor had me in her office one day and she's like you know connect you're just uh, trading one one addiction for another. You went from meth to, to, to Jesus, and she said it's all it's all fake and it's just an addiction for you and all this and that. And I'm like, you know what? You can say whatever you want to say. I know what's going on in my mind. I know what he did in my life, and and what you're saying to me ain't gonna have no effect on me at all. You know. So this was our relationship, man. She was just anyway. So uh, we get to this point in the program. It was probably two or three weeks of it. And we were dealing with victim impact and how we impact our victims. Because I don't think a lot of the individuals who do crimes, or especially those who think, you know, you're not hurting anybody but yourself, 
uh, you're still impacting somebody and they really wanted you to realize the impact that you made on people. So we were all supposed to pick one person in our lives that we negatively impacted and they were supposed to write a letter as to how we impacted them. Well, originally I went for my wife, but uh, they came back to me and said, you can't do that. Right. There's no contact. You yeah. can't even write her. And I'm like, all right. So I asked my mom <laughs> and now, uh, she, she didn't really want to do it at first and, but she did. Uh, so here's what happened. The, the letters, uh, were supposed to come in as they came in and the counselor received them. We would get called into the office individually when that letter arrived and, uh, she would give us a letter and we had to read it out loud to her. And then after that, when everybody got their letters, we were going to meet in a group and we had to read our letters to each other in the group. So I sat down, I looked at this and, and by the way, I think my mom broke a record. I think it was like 13 pages or something that she wrote. And I, I started reading and I think I got through the first paragraph or two and, and I, I just wept and, uh, I looked up at her. I'm like, how do you expect me to do this, man? I, ca I can't do this. And after I, she allowed me to silently read the letter. And, and after I finally got through that, um, I don't know how long later, um, I said, there's no way I can read this in group. I, I, I just ain't going to be able to do it. And it really ended up being a God moment because she allowed me to have another youngster in the group. He was probably 22 years old and he didn't have anybody to write a letter because he didn't have anybody. So, I asked that guy if he would be willing to read my letter for me, and he did, and that really impacted his life. So it ended up working out. So um, this is what I want to do then. I am going to attempt to read this letter about um, that my mom wrote, and she said she could have kept going and going and going, but she didn't. Uh, I read this one time in a school. <clears throat> I tried to, and uh, this this – it wasn't until this point, you know, there was a lot of transformation going on. The Holy Spirit was doing a lot of work. He really worked on me, including, you know, going through those three sessions in the Almond Tree program in the county jail about forgiveness and just coming to the realization, not so much, I think, of the just what kind of damage I did to people, but that there needs to be forgiveness there. And it wasn't until this letter where the impact it, it really hit me about, whoa, this is what I did to my own mother and, and, and thinking the whole time, Hey, I'm doing me. You do you. I ain't hurt nobody, but my own life, you know, I know you worry about me cause you're my mom, but don't trip, you know? Um, so let's attempt this letter. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm laughing m mainly cause I'm more nervous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let's else. try and laugh more. Uh, all right. <clears throat> This is going to be very painful for me to write. Through the years, I have tried pushing all the pain and all the heartache down into a deep part of me and try to forget. It all pretty much started when you were in school. We were always getting negative reports about you, and when you would do something wrong, it turned your dad away from you, and he would punish you, and it wouldn't be much longer, and you'd be doing something else. So right away it started. I, even messing up in school was impacting my mom. I mean, kids. When you're messing up in what you think are little things, man, it messes with your, your parents' mind because it's like, God, they love you and care for you so much. Mm. And it just pains them to see that the very person that they created through Christ that they created and they love so much is hurting themselves. It impacts us, man. So we finally started going to family counseling, but neither you nor your brother would share what was wrong and talk at all. So that was a waste of time. One time when you were younger, we left the store. You had a couple of small items you had taken, and I made you go back in the store and return them and tell them you stole them. Another time, I sent you into a store for something, and when you came back, you realized the gal giving you a, a couple of Susan B. Anthony dollar pieces. Most younger people won't know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> Mistaking yeah. them for quarters. I'm trying to make myself laugh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mistaking them for quarters, and I made you go back in and exchange them, telling you that was like stealing because that girl hadn't known they were dollars. I guess I'm trying to state just a few instances where you knew you did wrong and made you face them honestly. We took you to church and Sunday school and confirmation, and even during confirmation, many times I had to go and sit in the class with you so you would behave. In 1981, when my mother passed away from a massive stroke, after the funeral, 
we went home and we're working out in the yard and you had been driving the tractor and all of a sudden your dad was accusing you of deliberately running over nails and before I knew what was happening you and your dad were in a huge fight and you were threatening to take a scissors after him and telling him you were going to turn him in for child abuse and dad told me to call the social worker and you ended up being taken to juvenile hall I was so devastated here we just buried my mom and then my son and his dad were in a battle royale and you were gone. I can't even explain to you the horrible hurt I was feeling. I can't even remember all the things you've done and the years you've wasted with your rebellious attitude and continually broke my heart. Everything inside of me wanted you, my own flesh and blood, to take a hold. You ran away several times, and then your brother started running away and acting out also. Our family was totally falling apart. It seemed at that time I was the only one trying to hold the family together, but the more I tried, the worse it got. Your dad and I separated because we couldn't get along either, and you and your brother moved into a place in Chippewa Falls with me. One day when I came home from work, you were there with some other boys, you had to skip school, and there were bottles of liquor and who knows what else there, and you ran out the door and ran away again. At this time, I was working at the school as secretary for the school psychologist and special education teachers, and the embarrassment I went through was tremendous. Mm. At one time, you were sent to Lincoln Hills Boys School, and I don't remember what that was for. Eventually, I moved back home with your dad, but through many circumstances, it just didn't work out, and I ended up filing for a divorce after 24 years of marriage. So all these things my mom was going through mm. on top of me. Can you imagine how it was feeling? And then at the same time, you were arrested and put in jail for a sting operation and theft and selling stolen items. Out of the 40 others that were involved, you got the most amount of time. No one will ever know the torment and guilt of being a failure as a wife and mother. And how many times when going to or coming home from work, I just wanted to end it all and smash my car into a tree. And then I would realize I couldn't leave that burden on my family. So once again, I turned to the Lord for solace. My mom's heart was right. Then at this time also, your grandfather, my dad, was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And he had to go to a nursing home. He didn't want to be there. So I made a very hard decision of quitting my job and taking care of my dad at his house. I guess in a way it was also a way of escaping the continual embarrassment of mm. facing people. I will say that if it hadn't been for the support and love of my coworkers and friends, I would have never made it through this time. This year... <laughs> My body was shutting down from all the stress I was going through to the point where I ended up not even being able to walk. And I had to crawl out of my car on the ground and into the doctor's office. My mom was crawling. I didn't know what was wrong with me, but was told it was my body shutting down from stress. But I pulled through that also. When my dad passed away, I made a decision to move back in the woods with my best friend who has always been there for me. I realized that happiness is not about material things, but living as basic a life as you can with those you love and care about. Padre was even willing to have both you and Jeff share in his life with us, but all you both were interested in was drugs and a lot of foolishness. Right after my dad's passing away, your brother disappeared, and weeks later I got the news that he was caught up with the stolen car and who knows what else, and was in prison in Mississippi. You were both spending all your young years in prison, marking up your bodies with horrible tattoos, earrings in your ears and on your face, and you were into Satanism big time. I have to actually say I was afraid of you. Because there was a lot of talk of human sacrifices and young people involved in that who were killing their parents. And you changed your name from Brian to Ozzy, but I refused to call you Ozzy. 
With the help of the Lord, I made two beautiful children, and you have both desecrated your bodies and destroyed your lives constantly without regard for yourself or others who care about you. You stole from my sister and brother, from other family members, including myself, and then you were angry about how you were treated with not a care about who you were hurting in the process. It was all about you and what you wanted and what you needed. And both you and your brother ended up having a child without being married. I didn't even see your daughter or realize for sure she was your kid until she was 10 because you had told me you were sterile from all the drugs you'd taken. I've been robbed of my sons going through school. I'm graduating. Finding a job, making a decent living, finding a girl, falling in love, marrying and raising a family. There's been nothing to be happy or proud of. I've been lied to so much I don't believe a lot of what you say anymore because you always lied and manipulated people. You've done so many things I'm not even aware of. Then came the ma next major devastation. You came back to our place while we were working in the heat out on the road. And you drove in with a pretty nice car and you said you came to say goodbye that you and your girlfriend at that time were moving to Montana. Pudge asked if you would eat anything and you said no. So he asked me to go back in the house with you and fix you something to eat, but eat which I did. Everything you were telling me that day were all lies. Mm -hmm. And then you went out to your car in the trunk and gave me your diaries to have with me so I could read and find out about your life and shut the trunk. Just then Pudge came back and you seemed really nervous and in a real hurry to leave. You gave us both hugs and said you had to go, but then discovered you locked your keys in the trunk. Pudge was trying to explain how to get the seat out and you just tore the back end apart, not even caring about destroying that car. You finally managed to get back there and get your keys. We gave hugs again, and Pudge wished him well on his travels, and he went off. When we came back in the house, Pudge was going to sit at a stool and notice his gun was out of the holster that he keeps on his chair, and the first thought was that you had taken it. Remember when I said my mom was chasing me in that car, mm -hmm, and it wasn't mm -hmm. until I it wasn't even until I read this letter that I realized it was her. All the all the way up until then, I thought it was Pudge. I ran out to this car to the car screaming and bawling and saying over, no, no, why have you done that? And I drove as fast as I could, trying to catch up to you. But you were going too fast and I couldn't catch up. At this point, I wanted to die on the spot and I couldn't control my emotions. And I was shaking so bad. It was at this point we knew we had to report this to the police, so we drove to Cornell and reported it. At this time, the chief of police told us there was a warrant out for your arrest, and he wished he had known I lived in this area because we may have avoided this mess. The next day, we received word you have been apprehended in Minnesota unharmed, that you had gone to Cornell and shot your girlfriend's husband through the arm and grabbed her and left and went to a hotel in Minnesota. Supposedly, you had set the gun down, and she grabbed it and started shooting at you and grabbed a rifle and ran out. She called the cops, and they arrested you with no one getting hurt. The next time I heard from you was a letter you sent when you went to prison, and mainly it blamed me for reporting you, stealing our gun, and giving your diary to the police. What kind of mother was I to turn his own flesh and blood into the law? I threw your letter in the stove and burned it. Then and there, I decided there was nothing more I could do for you without destroying myself and my marriage, and I wasn't going to let that happen. I decided that all I could do was pray and take care, let God take care of things. I went to a drug counselor to talk, and here was a guy who had worked with you both, you and your brother, and he told me in so many words I had to let both of you boys go, and I had to quit blaming myself and start feeling good about myself and finding happiness in my life with my husband. He said both you boys chose your own path and are doing just what you want to do and would be just fine in prison practicing, practicing your satanic religion. When I left there, I was determined to get on with my life. Enough years had been wasted by worrying about you both and my health really took an effect with all the stress and depression. It was a long struggle. And with the help of Pudge and friends, I'm getting better. I don't feel writing this has been a help because it brought back all the horrible nightmare things that have happened. Like watching a bad movie. There's no way to really explain the effects this has had in my life as a mother. 
All the lies and thefts and drugs have made it so that not only do I find it hard to believe anything you say anymore, but it will be exceptionally hard for anyone whose lives have been affected by you. You've done nothing all, all those years but lie, manipulate people, steal, practice your satanic religion, and blame everyone but yourself all these years. I have felt like a failure for years as a mother. I tried teaching you right from wrong, telling you about the effects of drinking and drugs and family because of my parents and your dad's parents being alcoholics, but I sure feel like a failure. I've done the best I know how. I still go through times of depression, feelings of failure, the embarrassment and humiliation and the hurt and anger. If you ask through this if I love you, yes, I love you. But despite everything you've done, and the life you've chose to live all those years. I've learned one thing from you and your brother both, and that is you both over the years in prison have become, become gifted con artists by trying to make people believe in you with all your lies and schemes. This is why it's going to be hard for you and Jeff in the future. You're going to have to somehow try to gain pe people's confidence in you again. There's so many things I've not gone into, but it would take a book. All I can say is you need to do a lot of proving to others and yourself. I'm your mother. I love you, but I hate what you've done in the past to yourself and others. So at this point, we've talked about forgiveness and what has all happened. And, you know, you gave everything to God. And, man, that's not on me anymore. I gave it all. Almost seems like this is kind of easy for you up until this point. Yeah. In terms of giving myself to God. Wow, this is great. You've, you've talked about... I've, like that next morning, I just, a uh, weight's been lifted and everything is wonderful and it's awesome and I don't even care about this stuff anymore. And uh, like, wow, this is great. Like everybody should be a Christian. Like this is fantastic. Then this letter. Because that's the I one thing I think we don't want to think about. And you're right, we give that to God. But we kind of then want to forget about it. Like, nope, it, it, like in our brains, we, that never happened. Or like, oh, nope, I don't want my brain going there. I've moved past that. I gave it to God. I'm fine now. And this had to be a huge two by four across your face. Yeah. Well, and I'm saying that affectionately. Four. Yeah. That I think you needed this. Yeah, it, it definitely woke me up. I uh, really, that, that, that was the first time in my life I've ever been slammed with a realization of, of just what it was I did yeah. and to the person that I loved the most, the most. and that loved me the most. And, I needed it. <laughs> the Lord knew I needed it, and uh, and it happened. And and I tell you what, um, you know, just to just to give props to God again uh, that He is a God of many things, but He's also a, a God of restoration. You know, my mom. You've seen this letter, and my mom told me many times it's going to be a long time before I allow you on my property ever again. And uh, let me just say that within three months of being released after. Uh, I, I was staying with this family. Um, my mom and my stepdad asked me to come and live in a little house that they had on their property. Now, the other thing that I want to say about this, too, is that my mom, even though uh, I lived out there with them for a whole winter and, and, and just everything that, that we have done together and talked about together and prayed together. And when I was out there all that whole winter, we did Bible study together, prayed together every morning before I went to work. And for, I think it was at least seven, eight years um, after I was released and we had a relationship, she still blamed herself. She still did not and could not let that go. And it wasn't until... I was at an event in uh, Ladysmith. I did three schools in Ladysmith. And it was uh, through this pregnancy uh, center, uh, resource center there in, in Ladysmith that, that this lady that works there, she really has a heart for these kids. And she spends up her days in these schools and talks to kids and she's just there for them. And um, so they put, out, they put out this newsletter um, that they put out every month or every couple months after I went and um, kind of talked about what I talked about a little bit and then had some statements of, of some kids and how their lives were impacted about um, what I what I talked to them about. And there was a couple things in there. I had sent my mom that newsletter. I sent her everything that I do. And after she read some of the things that these kids said, she, she wrote to me, or no, she called me and said, I finally have allowed the Lord to take this out from me. 
And I forgive myself now. And I understand that it wasn't me. It was you. So even after seven or eight years of being together and, and having that relationship, she still held on to all that guilt mm. and blamed herself for it all. Yeah, that's uh, that's tough stuff. Yeah, this isn't you robbing someone and the victim here is the homeowner that lost some guns and some items that you stole. <clears throat> Animals and your mother, the only two consistence in all of these episodes yeah. that you showed any compassion for or caring yeah. for. And then, yeah, to find out this whole time, I mean, what she went through mm -hmm. and what mothers go through. Yeah. It's just it's got to break your heart. So, it, so yeah, and, and like I said in the very beginning of reading that letter, it ain't even, you know, sometimes we go to the hard things. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm in prison or I did a crime or whatever it is that, you know, we we might hurt our, our parents during that point, but even you saw it started out with even in school, yeah. you know, the things I was doing in the school to get in trouble, it, it humiliated my mom, it hurt my mom. Um, so, you know, it doesn't even have to be the drugs because mm -hmm. we, we come up with those excuses and justifications every time, you know, I'm, I'm smoking weed, whatever. I ain't hurt nobody but myself. Yeah, you're hurting your parents, man. You're hurting the people that love you the most. They don't want to see you smoking that crap. You know, you're messing up. Yeah. So even even the little things that started out with was was hurt my mom big time because I was her flesh and blood man, and you know this this all goes right back to Jesus because, and 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 where my mind was at when I was reading the Bible and I saw this loving long suffering God who just loves his children so much and it hurts him to see his children messing up and he just wants the best for them. And I see that so much in my mom, and that's where my heart is at for my children. Man, I I don't want to see my children messing up. It hurts me because they're flesh of my flesh and blood of my blood, man. And I've been through stuff, and I can, you know, hey, don't do this. Why? Well, be, I don't. Yeah. you don't need to know why. But <laughs> I, I, trust me, I know why. Right. <laughs> and that's why I don't want you to do it. But just uh, we have this love so much for our children and and i understand that there's people out there that don't have that and maybe they had parents that abused them and and raped them or whatever and might even but given them up and maybe you don't even have parents but I, I want you to know that you can still experience that love because god created you and he is the father and Amen. he loves you so much and he doesn't want anything but for you to flourish in your life and if you come to that realization and you come to know Jesus and have that relationship with Jesus, man, you can experience that love regardless of how long you've been caught up in your stuff. Look at me, 33 years, man, the enemy had me. And now every day for the last 14 years, I've experienced the love and joy and compassion and forgiveness and mercy and grace of my Father God. Regardless of whether or not I get that from anybody else, man, I, I get it from him. That's and right. I know the end game. And I know that eventually in eternity, I, that's that's all that there's going to be. There's going to be no more tears, no more fear, no more cancer, no more drama, no more none of that stuff. It's just going to be just indescribable. I think our heads would explode if we really could got if any we kind could comprehend of it. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For real. Well, that was uh, an excellent letter that she wrote and you're absolutely right that's what you needed to hear and i think it was important for many many different reasons but perhaps one of the biggest one was the you needed to hear that part i think if you had gotten that from your wife which you know that came back that was certainly god's hand on that whole situation because if she had just said something it wouldn't have impacted you as much probably or maybe it would right. have but certainly not i mean hearing from your mother Mm -hmm. But look where that got you now. Yeah. And look where it got you and your mother, your guys' relationship now. Yeah. And I feel so, I, I really do still, my heart goes out to your mom for carrying that with mm -hmm. her for all those years. Yeah. No, yeah, I mean, the, nobody wants that for their mother. I mean, no. And, and it's like, you know, the, the, the things that went through my mind. And, and I'd say when I'd read this letter to people, it's like, Especially get to that part where she wants to drive a car into a tree oh, or, or whatever. It's like my my mother, my mother. This we're talking about my Lord mother. Her. This yep. innocent Jesus loving 
she wanted to kill herself. Because and then of my mother crawling out of her car Ugh. on the ground downtown over the sidewalk into the my mother, yeah, that's uh, powerful. That is powerful. But obviously, uh, our takeaway here is hope. Hmm. Jesus, as always, right? Reconciliation. Reconciliation. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a thing. <laughs> gotta <Yeah>. find out because <laughs> yeah. i mean we we have to have that stuff in order to move on i almost yeah. kind of feel like we should have like you had to do that victim impact statement or you yeah. that was a part of your what you need to go through program. you need to summon to send yeah. something part of the program i almost feel like just in life we should have that every once in a while like oh, someone man. should just write that regardless <laughs> not necessarily about how much you've hurt me but maybe a little bit of that like the things that they've done or said that hurts you because i think we need to hear that stuff because we don't think how we're really impacting other people and our selfish decisions and our choices. As you've brought up in the last few shows, that it's not just you. You're mm -hmm. impacting so many other people you probably don't realize. And you, when you were in prison, you knew you were impacting other people. But you never thought to this degree, and certainly not to this degree with your mother. Right, right. You never even knew. Now, you're aware, like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm, my mom's disappointed in me. Dude, mm -hmm. this is beyond disappointment. She <laughs> right. wanted to take her car and run it into a bridge yeah. embankment and kill herself because of the, your choices. I mean, mm -hmm. that I, what? This is that's beyond disappointment. But then to yeah. see where you guys are now, yeah, and still are. That's freaking amazing. Still are. All right. You and I are both blessed with mothers that are oh, still alive and that we have, have great relationships twice, with, and we just soak in their wisdom. And <laughs> Yes. And the older I get, the, the closer I get to my mom. Yeah. I've always known she was smart. And to a lesser degree, I was a Brian Cole growing up. But uh, <laughs> right? I've embarrassed my parents. I've done so many dumb things in my life, uh, so many yeah. things that are, I'm ashamed of. But thankfully, I've kind of... Through, through, through God, I'm actually like having a relationship with God. And wow, that's different. Because again, different. going back to the very beginning, Christianity, people just think it's whatever. You know, and Bible yeah. nowadays is like the a la carte. You pick the yeah. parts that you like, and the yeah. ones you don't like, eh, I don't want to follow that. That's not really how it works. Yeah, that's like following some of your parents' rules. Yeah. How does that get you? <laughs> get you a lot <laughs> right. of discipline. Some of your rules. with the Lord, that's why obedience is so huge. <laughs> yeah, and I pretty much did that, you know, too. And look where that got me. Nowhere. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, it's kind of, you're all in or you're all out. That's kind of how it works, man. Yes, sir. All right. Well, we'll pick back up uh, next week. Uh, what are we talking about next week? Uh, hopefully getting released from prison. <laughs> <laughs> Crossing yeah. my fingers. Okay. <laughs> all right, man. Thanks so much. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. All right. I love you, brother. I love you too, man. Bye-bye.